Hello and welcome again to this introductory statistics video. In this particular video, we're going to talk about descriptive statistics. Uh, descriptive statistics are something that you may have studied in elementary school, in middle school, or in high school, especially in Algebra 2, or maybe all of the above. Uh, so this could be, especially if you're fresh from high school, a very familiar topic. So they have lumped a whole bunch of ideas into this chapter, and we're only going to cover the first half in this video, and then there's a second video to cover the second half. Uh, as always, be ready with your formula card, uh, your calculator, and your lecture notes for this chapter. Uh, the first two of which, the formula card and calculator, are your most important tools for all assignments in the entire course. And then uh, we'll start with the idea of a frequency table. A frequency table, as the name implies, must have a column for frequencies. So if it were a relative frequency table, I guess it wouldn't necessarily have to have the frequency column, although most of the time it would to compute the relative frequencies. Um, but uh, if it's called a frequency table, an absolute must is a column for frequencies. And then the second thing uh, that a frequency table always has to have is a column for the data values. Now, sometimes the data values are single data values like we see here, and sometimes there'll be a range of data values like zero to two, um, and then three to five. Uh, the width, the width, if, if it is a range of data values, the width has to be the same throughout. Uh, so that's what a frequency table is. And then pie charts uh, are used for categorical data. So you'll notice um, that we have clothing and footwear and accessories and fragrances and novelty items. These are non-numerical values that make up our pie slices, and that's as it should be. Uh, Minitab will allow you, the software that we'll be using for the course will allow you to use something other than, it'll allow you to use numbers, and not just categorical uh, variables, non-numerical va variables, um, but it's really better to do pie charts when you have categorical variables, uh, because there are other tools that we can use for numerical that are better than pie charts. And then each slice of the pie, you'll notice um, that 24% is about 25%, and 25% would be exactly one-fourth, so 24% is almost exactly one-fourth. Um, a third would be 33%, and this is just more than a third. Uh, so the, the size of the slice depends on the percentage that's represented. Uh, there are better charts even for categorical data, though, than the pie chart. Um, the pie chart is usually considered one of the worst statistical, but it's one of the most commonly used in especially newspapers. I guess they like the aesthetic look of the pie chart. Um, but bar graphs usually are better because you can more easily compare um, and easily see that the six and the five and the four are different heights. Even if they didn't happen to have six, five, and four labeled for you, you could easily compare the heights on a bar graph. Um, notice how the bars don't touch, and that's appropriate. Bars should not touch if they are for categorical data because there is no continuity between uh, here we have the the ways that animals protect themselves there's no continuity between talons claws and pinchers um, and horns and antlers so there's no it's not like it's one to two and then three to four where there is continuity um, so bar graphs in many ways do what all graphs and charts do, and they summarize the variable that's given. I think they do a really good job for categorical variables, certainly the preferred graph for categorical variables. Um, they have bars, as the name implies, for each category, and the heights of the bars represents how many, the frequency of the particular categorical um, category that you have there. Uh, and if we were to order from most to least, so we would start with 11, and then we would go 6, 5, 4, and then two and then two ones would be last. Um, so if we were start to start with the most and put it at the left and then go to the least, that's what we call a Pareto chart. So this is not a Pareto chart, uh, but you can certainly do them. And they even have a greater emphasis on comparing the different bars because you can easily see which one's the most and how different it is from the second most and the third most and so on. 
And then dot plots, you would take uh, your data values and you would make a single dot usually for every data value. Here, um, this says the dots represent one or two observations, up to two observations. So um, I imagine that if it's just a single data value, it might represent one. Um, but if it's a whole bunch of data values, then probably at least all but the top one definitely represent two, I would say. Um, and then the top one might represent one or two. Um, and, uh, but that's not typical. Usually we have a dot for every single data value. Um, not sure why they decided to go with every two data values here. Uh, but in that way, a dot plot is very similar to a bar graph because you can kind of see you could have made bars for all of these, except a dot plot tells you even more information than a bar graph would because it puts a dot at every exact value. Um, and sometimes bars lump values together um, for histograms. We don't have that here. Let's see if this is... Yeah, so here's a histogram. And we could not tell on this histogram whether the three numbers in here were 60 or 61 or 62 or 63 or 64. On a dot plot, though, you can tell um, that this number is 52 and this number is 53 and these are 54 um, and this one's 55 and, of course, this one's 56. So a dot plot, you could uh, really kind of reconstruct the data set, especially if they were single data value dot plots. You could reconstruct the data set from the dot plot. Whereas with a histogram, you cannot. Uh, with a histogram, you divide the data into intervals, um, equal width intervals, so that uh, all of your starting and stopping points have equal width. And then you just count how many things are between 60 to up to but not including 65, and then 65 up to but not including 70, and 70 up to but not including. So here you see there were, must have been three data values between 60 and 64, and three data values between 65 and 69, and then between 70 and 74 there must have been eight data values, and 75 to 79 there must have been 10 data values, uh, and then 5, and then 2. Uh, and so you would want to label the axes. This is the y-axis that goes up and down. Um, and it's always the frequency or the relative frequency. Uh, relative frequency is either proportion or percentage. And so you could, um, you could have a relative frequency histogram or a frequency histogram. I think frequency is the most common, but uh, I have seen proportion histograms and percentage histograms. And then along this x-axis that goes uh, horizontally, the x-axis always goes horizontally, and it always contains our data values. Uh, so here we have the data value of height in feet. Uh, for histograms, our data values are always going to be numerical. If it's not numerical, then it's called a bar chart, not a histogram, and the bars don't touch for a uh, bar chart, but they should touch for a histogram. Uh, I can't remember. It seems like that um, Minitab might not follow that rule, but I may be wrong about that. And then also you should have a title for the whole chart as well. And so we have those elements. And then interpreting histograms becomes important. Symmetrical means that it's a mirror image. And I didn't draw my line very well. Um, but if you go down exactly down the center, uh, then and you look at either side, um, it should be like you had a mirror held up in the very center. Uh, and you see that as it decreases, the other side decreases as it levels off, the other side levels off. If it were to increase, the other side would increase. So that's what we mean by symmetrical. And then skewed left to right, I usually think of you start as a symmetrical curve. And if they are um, pulling, and, and I think of I think of the curve as being like taffy, because when we were young, we made taffy together as kids once. Um, it was an experience, though, because you had to stretch and stretch and stretch and stretch and stretch. And uh, so pulling taffy was, was quite an experience. But I think of this as like pulling taffy. So if they're pulling from the left, 
they're going to distort the left side of the curve um, and not have it be perfectly symmetrical on the left side anymore. And that's what we call left skewed. Um, but if they are pulling from the right and toward the right, uh, then that's going to be right skewed or skewed to the right. So those are the shapes. Uh, and then we also have uh, examples of um, data that's skewed in real life or symmetrical. The IQ is symmetrical, perfectly symmetrical. It's actually defined to be that way. Um, so you have 100 is always defined to be exactly average. And then depending on which IQ test you take, you might have um, 130 and 70, a standard deviation of, of 30, to be all or nearly all of the data. So you would have very few um, people with IQs more than 130 and very few people with IQs less than 70. There would still be some. Uh, and then lifespan is um, naturally going to be left skewed because the majority of people will live to be at least 60 years old to 110 years old. Um, and then you'll have uh, a few people who will die in tragic accidents, accidents or illnesses or um, something like that that's pretty rare, but that can still happen. Uh, and then as, as you get closer and closer to like 60, uh, the health conditions are more and more likely. Uh, and then you peak with the average lifespan expected, average life expectancy. Um, so that would be left skewed. And then incomes are going to be right skewed. If you take uh, incomes, you know, most incomes are going to be five figures. Um, so that's, you know, anywhere between $10,000 and $99,999 annual income would be a uh, five-figure income. But then you're going to have uh, some incomes be six figures, and then you're going to have some incomes be even more than six figures. Uh, so that's going to be a right skewed distribution. And then also when we talk about shape, we can talk about uh, particularly unimodal and bimodal. Unimodal means there's one significant mound of data. Um, you might have, uh, even if this bar had been down here, where it slightly dipped and then went back up, that I would still consider this unimodal. Um, so it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect, um, but the data should trend so there's just one significant mound of data. Um, here the data clearly trends so that there are two mounds of data. Um, uni means one, so unimodal is where there's one significant mound. Bi, like bicycle with two wheels, means two, and so you've got uh, two significant mounds of data here. Uniform means that it's roughly flat, but see that it doesn't have to be perfect, um, so that there are dips and increases, but if you consider normal variation, you know that if you did a different data set, you would get different bar heights, um, that you can see that this is probably meant to be a uniform distribution. And then here, there are several distinctive um, peaks uh, that you can see, and there's just so much data in this one, you can see it's definitely more than this one. So this one's actually considered multimodal. Anything more than two, we would call multimodal. And then an outlier, um, this one is probably an outlier, I would say, um, and then these two are definitely outliers. Um, and if, this, if, if these bar heights were shorter or this one was taller, then I wouldn't say this one was an outlier, but we've got, um, let's see, 220 data values in this one, 200 data values in this one, uh, and maybe not very many in this one, but 10, 10 or 12, so um, 40 plus here, uh, and it, maybe five or six here. But this one, it just looks like one single data value compared to all these hundreds right here. Um, and again, this one looks like one single data value here and one single data value here. So I would say we have three outliers in this data set. Um, we'll more rigorously define what an outlier is in the next section. And then to compute the mean, um, these uh, blue lines are kind of to show you that uh, this is the median right here for this data set. But to compute the mean, you'll look on your formula card and you'll see this crazy capital sigma. 
Um, so this is, we use a lot of Greek letters in mathematics, um, and this is the capital letter sigma. And all it means is to add up all the data values. So each of these data values are like called x values for our variable x. And so we would call this like x1, and this one would be x subscript 2, um, and then 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So this one would be x subscript 7. And what this is saying is take those seven data values and add them up. Well, that's exactly what we've done right here in our enumerator. We've taken the seven data values and we've added them up. Sorry, I, I can't circle very well. Um, and then we divide by seven and that gives us our answer of 11.4. There is actually an easier way to do this on the calculator though. Let's do that on the calculator. Uh, and so uh, if I bring up my calculator, yeah, I've already typed the numbers in. Uh, let me show you that though. So stat and then edit, um, and I'm gonna actually highlight and clear because uh, it won't take me long to 1, 1, 3, 6, 9, 18, and 42. And uh, Oops, 40. And I'm just hitting enter 42. Okay. Third time's the charm, right? Um, so I'm just hitting enter after each one to get to the next one. And then, just as your formula card says, uh, we will press the stat key. And then uh, calc is the next option, so we'll scroll right to get to calc. And then one is the number for one bar stats, so I could hit one or enter since one's already selected here. Um, and then I want my list to be L1 because when I typed into the calculator, I was typing into L1. Uh, if L1 wasn't already here, I could do second and one because see L1 is there in blue and the second key is blue. Uh, so that second and one would get me to L1. If I happen to have a list like for a frequency table, that we did back up here. So if I were entering this data and I happen to have four ones, um, then I could put this list into L1 and this list into L2, and then I could do as my frequency list, second two to say it's L2. I don't actually want to do that though, so I am going to clear that out um, because the data that I want is, um, it, it does have a repetition of ones, but we typed one twice and so we already accounted for that repetition of ones. So we don't have a frequency list. We don't need a frequency list. Everything uh, that we've typed appears exactly once and should appear exactly once. And so it tells us our um, mean is 11.4 if we round to only three significant digits. And that's exactly what we um, have here. If we had added all these numbers together, that would have given us 80, because you see our sum of x is 80 and so 80 divided by 7. Uh, this doesn't give us our mode. Our mode is the 1 because we will talk about later the mode is the most frequently occurring data value um, and our mode is 1. Um, it does give us our mean too. We haven't talked about our mean yet. Uh, they've circled it here as well. Or, I'm sorry, our median. Um, we haven't talked about the median yet but it will be 6. Uh, and then our mean is quite different from our median here. It is 11.4 instead of 6. That's very different, um, probably because of the 42. Also, the 18 is quite a bit different from these other numbers as well, but the 42 is especially um, larger than the 1136 for sure. And so that's uh, how we can compute our mean, and the more data values we have, the larger those data values are, the happier we'll we will be that our calculator will do that math for us. Um, of course, it'll become particularly valuable in the next video when we do standard deviation that uh, if we had computed by hand would take us a massive amount of time. And then the median, we've already mentioned the median in our calculator. Uh, so here we have two data sets to show you that they're kind of two different ways if you're computing the median by hand. Uh, that you will compute the median. So on this first data set, we have an odd number of data values. And if there are an odd number of data values, then there's going to be one number that's exactly in the center. And so here, five is exactly in the center. Um, here though, if you have an even number of data values, then your uh, 
you've got two numbers in the center. Oh, and I should mention that the first step of doing the median by hand is to order your um, data values. So you can see how both of these, uh, oops, both of these lists are ordered from least to greatest. Um, and you could do greatest to least. That would be fine too. Um, we usually do least to greatest then. And then the second step is to find the data value that's exactly in the middle, um, as we've done here. And here we have two data values in the middle, so what we end up doing is just averaging them. And I can tell easily in my head that the average of 99 and 101 would be 100. So we have 100 as our median here, and 99 as our median here. Or we could do one of our stats like we did on the previous set of data, and scroll down with our cursor until we get to the median. Either way. And then, uh, as we especially saw on our first example, uh, it must have been very right skewed data because remember we had a median of 6 and a mean of 11.4. So, uh, whenever the mean is pulled further to the right than the median, that means that you have right skewed data um, because the mean is pulled to the right. And the mean is the one that gets pulled around. The median stays consistent. Um, if you change, if you add in outliers or you add in data values that will skew your distribution, uh, the median will stay pretty consistent. And so it's for that reason that if we have very skewed data, we want to use the median instead of the mean. But if our data isn't terribly skewed, um, if it is approximately symmetric, um, then we want to use the mean instead of the median because it, it considers every data value. Um, so as long as we don't have extreme data values or extreme skewness, uh, we want to use the mean. Um, here, a left skewed distribution would be pulling the mean to the left and it wouldn't affect the median. So um, that, that's some advantages and disadvantages when you go to determining which measure of center. Uh, you don't ever want to use the mode for quantitative data because the mode uh, isn't, it doesn't incorporate as much information. Um, so again, we call the median a resistant measure because it resists the change. It's almost always unaffected. Um, and the mean is not a resistant measure, so it does not resist the change. And here's a nice example, um, and this is a fulcrum, what we call a fulcrum, but you can kind of think of it as a seesaw. Um, so picture a seesaw, and picture these as maybe very heavy marbles on this seesaw. Um, and so if we were to take this rightmost marble and move it much, much further to the right, uh, then that would definitely affect the balance here, and we would have to move the fulcrum uh, significantly to the right, not as much as we move the marble, but still significantly to the right to keep the balance. Um, so it wouldn't balance uh, if we move this marble to the, to the right um, a significant amount. It would not balance until we move the fulcrum a little bit to the right. Uh, but the median would remain unchanged. This one would still be right here. That marble would still be the middle marble. We could even move all three of these to the right and the median would not be changed, but the fulcrum, which is the mean, um, would definitely move significantly to the right if we moved all three of the marbles to the right. Uh, so the median doesn't um, usually get affected by uh, extreme data values or outliers or skewness but the mean is affected by all of these things. And then the mode is going to be great for categorical data. Um, so it's not great for quantitative data. You want to use the mean for quantitative data unless you have extreme skewness. And if you have extreme skewness or outliers, then you want to use the median for quantitative data. But the mode you want to use for categorical data. So it's perfect for categorical data because if, if you have categories like red, yellow, orange, and green, you can't average those categories. You can't add up red and yellow and divide by two. Um, that's just not possible. You can't even compute the median of red, yellow, orange, and green because there's no ordering to red, yellow, orange, and green um, that makes sense in a way that quantitative ordering makes sense. And so the only thing that you can do is you can count the number of um, red cars that you have. You probably don't have orange cars. Uh, well, you may, I guess, um, 
have orange cars in rare circumstances. Um, you do have some yellow cars, not very many, but there was a canary yellow that was popular with the Mustang there for a while. Um, and then blue and green, did we have very many green cars? My dad had a green 50 Chevy once. It was really cool. It was a truck, actually, um, but we'll count it as a car, automobile, the broader category. So, yeah, but uh, mode, you could count the number of cars that are a particular color. Um, and that's the mode, the most frequently occurring one, which would not be orange and not be green, uh, not be yellow, but um, probably maybe gray or black or red, or something like that. And then, uh, to wrap things up, use uh, these materials, these lecture notes, also your formula card and your calculator. Um, and in addition to stuff that we haven't used while we were taking these notes, your textbook and your Newton instruction, uh, and message me as you work on discussions and homework and projects and quizzes. Um, so uh, use these, this is kind of the order, um, use these first four before you message me. Um, though your textbook will become even more valuable and maybe even moved up to number one for uh, your discussions and your projects. Uh, so use all these things together and this will really help you um, if you're using your tools. It will really help you to excel on the homework, to excel um, and, and cut your time short on uh, the home quizzes and the projects and the discussions and getting used to uh, these first two, which you will also have on the exams, that'll be a huge benefit to you when you go to take the exams. So thank you and good luck.